good afternoon everybody it's the cryptid huntress i'm jessica jones and man am i glad to see you guys today i have been a busy busy girl and what does a busy busy girl do that is running a show a youtube channel she adds another show to her lineup to become even more busy and i cannot wait you guys oh my gosh i just made the announcement today this is actually the announcement right now i put it on social media you guys are going to get the cryptid huntress on saturday nights again i know i was over at spaced out radio on saturdays we're coming to this channel on saturday nights at 10 p.m so i hope you guys will come join me we're going to have a show every saturday 10 p.m eastern 9 central 7 pacific and uh, and it's going to kind of revolve around field research boots on the ground field research i'm going to bring the best in the business in the research field on and, and by business i just mean researchers <laughs> okay and uh and also uh, and it doesn't have to be just boots on the ground researchers okay um actually i have ryan paul tremblay coming on the show as my first saturday night guest we're going to be talking about skinwalkers wendigos uh dog man all that stuff this is going to be my first time hosting ryan tremblay on saturday night so we're starting off with a bang y'all it's going to be so great so please come join me uh you know i've also got my show tomorrow night our remote viewing show is on thursdays so i've got a show for you guys for tomorrow i'll announce that after the show today uh but saturday night we have a brand new show and then i'll be at spaced out radio on sundays so you guys get me four days a week now okay live live shows in addition to all the other shows and podcasts that i go on okay so wow okay all right well i have a fantastic show for us today i have my buddy charles andrews of catskill mountain bigfoot here today we're going to be talking about the mountain monsters out of the catskills and uh and if you guys will remember i've had charles on my show at spaced out radio we just didn't have enough time to talk on that show so i brought him back today we're going to go there with all the different cryptids his experiences in them mountains in them their mountains okay so that's going to be amazing if you guys would like to follow along with all of my shows go to my website that's the cryptidhuntress.com uh, all of my shows are there all the events i'm going to be at including the spaced out radio fan party in reno nevada that's in may go to the spaceoutradio.com website for information on that please uh, also i have a patreon if you guys would like to join my patreon uh you can go to the cryptid hunters on patreon and do that also i just saw i got a brand new channel member today and uh, and i want to thank you so much let's see where's my new channel member uh we have a we have a membership here at the cryptid huntress channel thank you addicted to knowledge 39 i got a new member today so I put exclusive content on that membership tab, okay? And uh, the last one was <laughs> the picture looked like a, a Bigfoot Karen. Let's just go there, y'all. It was a Bigfoot Karen. I, I, I gave her a new hairstyle and um and that that's a great video. So it's, it's really revolves around spiritual guidance and stuff like that. So become a member of the Hunt Club on the Cryptid Hunters channel. All right, thanks to all my members. Everybody with a star by their name is a, a channel member. So thank you guys from the bottom of my heart. Okay, well, that is a lot to unpack for that intro. Let's get to our show today because I've got my friend Charles here to talk about monsters in the Catskill Mountains. Okay, so it said, oh, and it's not just monsters too. Let me read this little intro. Um, so we're talking about monsters in the Catskill Mountains. I have Bigfoot field researcher Charles Andrews of Catskill Mountain Bigfoot here today. Uh, historically, this area has legends of gnomes, witches, werewolves, Sasquatch, and giants. It's said that the Catskill Mountains were, were once the home of a giant monster that fed on humans until the great spirit turned it to stone as it was traveling to the ocean to bathe. The bones of the monster became a new mountain and rainwater filled the eye sockets, forming two lakes near the summit. So there is no short shortage of mystical creatures of the Catskills and Charles has had many encounters of his own. Charles Andrews is a Bigfoot researcher from the Catskill area of the Catskill Mountains. Located in upstate state New York, 
who has a Bigfoot research team called Catskill Mountain Bigfoot. They conduct field research on multiple family groups in the areas in which they inhabit. From October 20, 2021 to October 2022, he conducted a year of full-time research with a minimum of five days a week, which allowed him to work many different theories and hypotheses, ultimately obtaining an abundance of knowledge and information retaining to the Bigfoot species of the Catskill Mountains. Charles's research and explorations can be found on his YouTube channel and his Facebook group, Catskill Mountain Bigfoot. Please help me welcome to the show, my buddy, Charles. Hey, That's Charles. Good. Thank you for being here today. Man, You're this welcome. is exciting. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Okay, well, I'm, I'm excited to have you here. I brought you on Space Out Radio a, a little while back, a couple of months ago, and we had the best conversation uh, about your research and the Sasquatch up there in New York. What's what's new? Anything going on? You've been out there researching? I really haven't been out much. I went out with Long Island Bigfoot maybe like a month ago. Other than that, I haven't been out much. Oh, okay. We got Long Island. Bigfoot. We got Long Island Bigfoot in the chat today. Hey, Long oh, Island. There he is. He's here. Yeah, we went out to one of one of the habitats. I brought him out to a tree structure, like a real cool one. And pretty much all the way there, there was some sort of activity or another, like tree oh. breaks and other tree structures, and starting right in my backyard. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, you know, I actually was up in New York last year with Long Island Bigfoot, and he took us to a spot or two. We went to Camp Hero up at Montauk and did some Bigfooting up there, uh, along with Brian from Montauk is Strange and Michael Roser from Dark Hour Paranormal. And we had some really interesting activity up there on that Long Island. So I know they're up there. Is it like uh, literally on Long Island? Is that where it was? Yeah. Oh yeah, it was like the very, on the very island of Long Island, not off it at all. Some north I, or something. It was it, it was it was right on the it island, was, right? It was at camp. It was at Camp Hero. So that's that's was, crazy. Yeah, up there we we stayed in the Hamptons. It was fancy. It was super fancy. But uh, well, in all reality, as and they're going to be anywhere as long as you have a significant sized batch of woods and the qualifications for a habitat, they're going to be there. I mean, I guess it really doesn't matter if majority of Long Island is populated, as long as there's portions of it that have significant sized batches of woods all year long water source that they don't have to compete with humans all year long food sources and obstacles that, you know, so you're not just walking into their habitat. There's always obstacles. You're never going to walk into a, a just a flat piece of wood. You can have all those other qualifications. There's no obstacles. There's no Bigfoot. But if they if that's the, the if the place has those qualifications for a habitat chances are there's a family group there probably been there for a very long time yeah well you you seem to know some of the habitats around where you live and you've got you've actually later you've identified some family groups right uh because yeah, I, I, I that. okay because i remember reading that you said that you uh you think that they're actually bigger than the bear habitats out there right you know what? At first, I was saying like uh, equal to, but I was just trying to be conservative. In all reality, the truth is that there's just more Bigfoot in the Catskill and Carroll area of the Catskill Mountains than black bear. It's just, just what it is. You know, I guess I, I, I don't really care about being conservative too much. I'm just going to tell you what it is. I was saying that's probably equal to, but that's not the truth because the truth is in every single habitat that has a family group, there's bears. And as I'm researching and looking for these Bigfoot tracks, you know what else I see? The bear tracks. And I see the bears. So I get a really good idea over a period of time how many bears are in the area and how many Bigfoot are in the area. And every single time the Bigfoot outnumber the bears. So once you get through a handful of family groups, now you're really outnumbering the bears. Right? So. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, um, well, that's great. Have you ever seen like families with like children, like what I guess kids, 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 Sasquatches, kid Bigfoots with the with the moms and the dads? I've never personally seen a kid Bigfoot. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. I got that one picture right, that I sent to you last night. Yes. Um, but I always find the tracks. The tracks are always there. OK, the tracks are over there. I forgot to yep. upload that. I'm going to try to upload it while we're talking today. Okay. So sorry. I, I forgot to upload that uh, because I was, I, guess I got busy last night. Forgot to do that. But uh, 
but okay so you can actually just kind of walk out your door right or there's a time where you can just walk out your door and everything's well, right there in your backyard the thing's gonna happen here because they're already coming mm -hmm. in the backyard yeah let me show you something i'll be right back okay all right, yeah. Charles Charles lives in the middle of the Catskill Mountains, y'all. And uh, and from when I brought him on uh, Space Talk Radio, we were talking about how he could see the mountain where the story of Rip Van Winkle actually happened. Okay, so we're gonna get into that in just a minute. As All well. right, you see this? Right. Okay, eggs. These eggs? are my eggs. Okay. So when me and my daughter we get eggs, we don't eat many eggs, so they're always old, right? So these are white eggs that I get from the store, okay? And I put these eggs in the backwoods, up high on a tree, in like a Y of a tree, right? They take the white eggs and they leave me these. That one you can't tell, but it's light brown. Oh, well, brown. there we go. Right? Yeah. That one's light brown. There's two light brown ones. There's two dark brown ones. They're stealing them from chicken coops. And there's a chicken farm about 300 yards from my house. Big chicken farm, like five buildings of chickens i leave them these white ones they take the white ones they leave me these brown ones i haven't eaten i'm not going to eat them i don't know um i'm a little sketched out about eating them but i keep them well i mean so, so so you would consider that to be like a gift then so you're you're leaving them something and then they'd leave you they bring you something back well, that's the first time that they've ever left me some. The other place I would do apples and peanut butter jars, right? I never did eggs. I don't have apples or peanut butter right now. I had eggs, and we always have, like, eggs left over in the container. So I just put them back there. And the habitat that is, like, that way, I guess, I don't know. The family group that lives that way, like right below what used to be the Catskill Game Farm, which Long Island with Bigfoot was telling me, they found out that that's like the oldest forest in America or something. The really? forest that surrounds Cat, the old Catskill Mountain Game Farm, they found, maybe if he's on here, he could write what, what it, what's the deal. Because I don't really know as good as he does. Okay, um, about we'll keep, the we'll keep a look forest, right? So there's a family group that lives in there. And right across the street from those ridges that they live in is that chicken farm. So during the summer, when you're hiking through that habitat, there's eggs all over the place, right? For, for two miles from the chicken farm, everywhere on log stumps and, and something that's taking the eggs and bringing them way far away and eating them without breaking them on the way. Um, I mean, it's just in my opinion, it's the Bigfoot. So when I lived, I moved here and now that family group is like 300 yards that way. Uh, I said, all right, I just leave the eggs because I ain't got no peanut butter. I ain't got no apples. Wow. Okay, and well, I, I like eggs better than peanut butter, personally. I love <laughs> eggs. I eat eggs every well, single day. This is this is what I tell people. Like, if, if you live somewhere and you're like, maybe I got some Bigfoot in the woods, take a peanut butter jar, take this seal off, put the top on, not all the way, but like, so it won't fall off and nothing could fumble it off, right? Put it out there. Don't go get it for three weeks. Like, don't run right back out there to check it because they're not going to mess with it then. Put it out there and just forget about it for like three weeks. Go back in three weeks. See what's up. Chances are only the lid is going to be there. The jar is going to be gone if you have a family group in the area. Now, once you do this a few times and they're taking the jars regular, now you can start doing it, putting it out and going out like three days later. You, you, you'll shorten the time. You see what I'm saying? But first you want to put it out there, leave it for like three weeks. Then go check, you know, and, and do that for like five times. And then you could start shortening the time down to like three days. If, you, if you're putting it out there and going the next day, they're not going to take it. It's too much. Uh, it's just too much definite that they're there. And, and that's just not the way they do things. Okay. Well, so you're out there exploring like myself. We're out in the woods. We're looking for Bigfoot sign. We're, we're you know, looking for Bigfoot basically, but we come across other things, other cryptids in the woods. Now, have you ever come across anything other than a Bigfoot out there? Well, I, I got lots of little people pictures. They're like four inches tall. I don't know. But the problem is I don't crop my pictures really to look in them. OK, I magnify. I got a really strong magnifying glass and I look at it you know, with the magnifying glass because when you like, you know, crop the picture, pull it and make it bigger, it just pixelates everything. So now when you're talking about something that's only this big for like four inches tall, now you you can't see it no more. But when you use the magnifying glass, you'd be surprised what you find. So now in 
habitat number two, there's this one batch of woods that's like real. When you walk into it, it almost sounds like you're in a tunnel. It's strange. Like if you go in the woods and you start whistling, it, it's almost like the whistles echo. Which it's, it's real strange. And uh, and I started noticing these little people looking things. So then I started looking for them with the magnifying glass. And it's only in this one little section of woods. And uh, yeah, dog man, right? So here in the Catskill Mountain region, the dog man cohabitates with the Bigfoot. I mean, it's just what it is. You get there in the same picture in the same area, right? But also across the river in the Hudson Valley is the same thing. The lady over there, uh, Bigfoot researchers of the Hudson Valley, same thing. Big, the dog man cohabitate with the Bigfoot. And they've seen it like with their own two eyes, like a dog man with baby Bigfoot. Really? Yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, what's the Gail Beatty from Bigfoot Researchers of the Hudson Valley. Okay. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Well, why do you think there's so much activity up there of all there's these so cryptids? Is, is it because it's so ancient? Like, the woods are so ancient and there's just something about it? Do you think there's portals up there? I know this is kind of, if, if you believe in, like, portals and the supernatural yeah. aspect. I think that what you said, the, the woods is, it's very old woods, right? Uh, but it's a lot of woods. You, you see, there's a lot of woods. Yeah, there's houses and there's roads, but the, where I live is right in the Catskill Mountains, like right directly at the base before you go start going straight up and you can't build houses on it no more. That's where I live. So that's what I think the deal is. Now, From if you were to pull out a map and you were to look at a topo map of Catskill, New York, and you were to draw a line up to Hudson River, and then there's like Route 23 that goes from Catskill to what's called Palinville. And you got Route 23 that goes from Catskill to Cairo. And you were to draw a line at the Hudson River, draw a line at those two roads, and then square it off or rectangle it off, right? Inside that, I know of at least six different family groups. It's only like a 20-square-mile area. There's the foothills of the Catskill Mountains. It creates these significant-sized batches of woods that are full of ridges and valleys berries and deers and springs and everything that you need for a qualification of a habitat and there's a different family group in every single one wow i know that's hard, kind of hard for people to swallow but that's just the truth the problem is is most people they go they go so you got somebody and they're a bigfoot researcher right well they go out like once a month and 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 they like they believe in modern science and they're like watching television and so I'm going to go out and do some Bigfoot research. You, you're never going to find that out. The only reason why I know is because I live amongst all this and I did it full time for a full year, which I was able to take length and width on all the track sizes and realize that these track sizes only stay in these woods. In like, let's say 13 inches, a common track size. OK, mm -hmm. this woods is 13 by seven. That woods is 13 by five. That's not the same individual. Those are two different same age individuals with the same track size. Different girth. Do you, do you see where I'm coming from? Oh, I know exactly what you're saying. And, and it's so cool that you're actually out there. Do, you were doing that and getting those exact sizes and paying attention to that. Now, I want to go back to the to the point you made about the Bigfoots being seen or not not the Bigfoots, the dogmen or werewolves. I guess it's dogmen being seen with baby Bigfoots. Now, yeah, I, it, I've never heard that before. Check it out on the lady's uh, page. She talks about it all the time. Okay. But I, I don't, I've never seen that personally. I just know that they live in the same batch of woods. And when you take pictures and you go look in the background of them pictures, you got Dogman and Bigfoot in the same area, in the same area that your picture is being taken, which is not a very big area. They're cohabitating together as a group. Whoa. I don't normally say stuff like that, but. Because if you could get somebody to wrap their head around, if I was talking to somebody that came to my house and I'm telling them about Bigfoot, I would not tell them that, right? Yeah. You, if you could get them to wrap their head around the Bigfoot thing and then you start talking about Dogman and they're living together, now it starts sounding real crazy to non-believers. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, there's there's very few stories that you hear out there and encounters of Bigfoot and Dogman together. I've heard maybe a couple uh, in my in my time of being a cryptid huntress on youtube over here uh and so but the story the stories get a lot of attention because people always wonder and people ask me about that all the time do dogmen and bigfoots cohabitate are they mortal enemies 
you know, because well, this is what I think about that. I think mm -hmm. that, okay, so all these batches of woods, they have the qualifications for a habitat, but there's got to be something else a little bit special about it. Like the habitat number one, that our first habitat, habitat number one, the woods are so spooky. My mom won't even go there no more. Won't even go there no more. Won't step foot into them woods no more. Really? Um, yeah, there's some sort of energy source. There's something going on with the woods. There's weird voices showing up on the recordings, on the videos. One of them sounded like, we don't want you here no more. And she, as far as she was concerned, it said, we don't want you here no more. And she said, okay, I ain't coming back. Oh uh, but, okay, so now, if there is some sort of energy source in these batches of woods that they're picking, uh, the other cryptids are going to use the same energy source, right? Maybe that's why you're finding them all in the same batches of woods. Maybe there's something about the batches of woods. Maybe it's portals. Maybe it's uh, energy, some sort of energy sources that they're feeding off of. I sent you that night vision uh, picture the other day. Yes. The one where you can see the hue off the head of one and then the face of another. And I told you, I think it's the face of a baby looking over the shoulder, right? Yes. If you watch the video of that, the branch above the head with the hue keeps going like this. It flickers down and back up, down and back up. It, and, and it was such an odd motion that it was like it, the motion was alien to me, right? And now looking back on it and being, this tablet is real good for me to look at my pictures. It's much bigger than a, a phone or the other tablet. And uh, now really being able to look at that picture and what was going on over there. When in, You look at the video, there's a branch right above that one's head. Yeah, That's just a picture. I have a 10 minute video of that, right? It comes down. And it like flickers back up and it comes down and flickers back up and then it comes down and flickers back up. And maybe one was just pulling on it and letting go, pulling on it, but maybe energy was pulling it. Uh, again, the guy, Mike, when we were talking, he was, you know, telling me his theories on uh, the, the, you know, universal energy of the earth and then why he thinks that they entangle all those tree branches and stuff. And he thinks that they're utilizing it as some sort of energy source. And that's, you know, oh yeah. Okay, so I heard that too. I, okay, so I I get that too. And those are some of the tree the tree structures, the little tree bins that I find out there. They're they're clumped together, kind of like in a within a let's just say like a hundred yard rate uh, distance. Okay, like a hundred mm -hmm. yard distance, there'll be like four or five of those scattered about the the tree line. And so it there's it so and, and you know of course I'm I'm kind of skeptical and I'm like well it could have been a human, but then you look at it. I don't think a human would have taken that tree and twisted it like that, you know? So I don't know. So there may be some kind of power generating source to that. That's what I think. Yeah. I don't think they're all it's just like a, a sign or a symbol. Cause I find them in like places that there would be no reason for a sign or a symbol. Right. Yeah. I found one the other day. I brought my nephew out, brought him fishing with his buddies and stuff. And sure enough, and it was, it's at the swamp at habitat number two. So when we went down there, there was a nice little triangle Bigfoot structure. I made a little video of it. And uh, if you look at that, no humans doing that. They're yeah. entangling dead tree branches without breaking them. Think about that. Exactly. And all the, and all, uh, okay, so they made like a triangle, right? They mm -hmm. Made a triangle uh, out of like five different branches. All these branches were pre existing on the ground, right? So the back ends of the branches still have all the foliage over them, years of foliage, right? Mm -hmm. They picked these dead branches up off the ground entangle them and made a perfect triangle while not taking the ends out of the ground do you understand what i'm saying i, I do 100 i got the video on my youtube channel check it out yeah. uh they picked them up off the ground pre-existing made entangled them made a perfect triangle without taking the bottom part of the stick out of the ground it's still covered with foliage they just picked it up twisted and tangled it where they needed it and and kept it moving to the next stick and didn't. Wow. Yeah. That's that's amazing. We have we have a, a question from. Do that. I don't care. I don't care. A person no. can't do that. That's just a mainstream media propaganda trick. There's there's definitely an art to whatever they're doing out there, and it's something that we we as humans probably don't do or can't do. So. Yeah, um, that's like have, a break. You yeah. can't. You, cannot mistake a bigfoot tree break for a mother nature tree break once you learn what a bigfoot tree break looks like they grab it with their hand like this and they break it like that okay so they're all broken and twisted the same exact way okay uh 
Mother in, in Mother Nature doesn't do that. I'm sorry. So once you learn how to identify a Bigfoot tree break, you would never mistake one for the other unless you're reaching for something. And if you're reaching for something, you're probably not that great of a researcher to begin with. So nobody probably cares. But if you're a good researcher and you got some good stuff, you're not reaching. And that is a Bigfoot tree break. There's no mistaking it. I don't care about rot, wind, snow, other human beings or anything else. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, this is a good question from the Fortmans. Hey, Coco, uh, would it be more difficult to dis distinguish juvenile Bigfoot tracks from human? Well, yeah, for some people, for sure. But um, if you're if you're a tracker, so. you can tell the difference. Well, I, I, I tell you what, for one, the baby Bigfoot tracks sink deeper in the ground than my adult track would ever dream of. That's one. Okay. So you can see the heaviness of this five inch track. Okay. And a human foot in a big foot foot, all right, a big foot foot. How much foot would a big foot foot if a big foot could foot foot? Um, and a big foot foot uh, are, are two very different things. Big foot foot are much girthier. They're wider. Their toes are different. Their big toe is like splayed out like this kind of. It's weird, right? The big toe is almost, I don't know if I could make like a, it's like this kind of, right? The big toe is not like our big toe. It doesn't set like our big toe. It almost sits out a little bit to the side. And okay. they're just different. They're not the same. They're they're shorter and fatter. All the juvenile tracks, to me, juvenile tracks are always short and fat. Like sometimes they're practically oval, like like no yeah. sort of foot shape to it. Once you get past the toe, it looks like uh, uh I don't know, like a fat foot. It looks like uh, a, a it looks like a thick foot. Like it's it's got thick, got some thickness it, to it. It's wide. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's not and so the toes are spread out. Yeah, the toes are it, spread out. It doesn't look nothing like a human foot, unless you got some real looking, I don't know. It doesn't look nothing like a human foot. And also you got to take in any Bigfoot track, if if you're in the Catskill Mountains, you ain't got no sand, you ain't got no nice soil, it's all rock. So if you got a track, that means that Bigfoot was boogieing. He was putting some real pressure on that ground. So with every track, you have a in indentation into the ground. So now yeah. if it's a softer soil, that track will sit three inches into the earth with a five inch baby track. Yeah. You, you understand the difference? If you have a five inch human baby, you don't even know it walked over the ground. You okay. got a five inch track from a Bigfoot baby, it's three inches into the ground. Well, you're, you're probably also finding little tiny gnome tracks out there potentially. Have you ever seen any little tiny feet like what these gnomes could potentially leave? One time I thought I found some, but then I did some research and I think it was fisher cats. Okay. Uh, so so that so see this is the importance of knowing all the different animals that are in your area that you're researching because you need yeah. to be able to distinguish what you're looking at. Oh my gosh. And I have one of my favorite trackers in the chat today, Daryl Neese. He's part of my team with North Georgia Cryptid Researchers and ASOG. What's up, Daryl? <laughs> it's good to have you here. Yeah, we're talking about tracking a little bit here and uh I, I am really interested actually in talking about since we, we've covered the Bigfoots and some dogman sightings that you've had up there that, that, that are commonly seen in the Catskill Mountains. Let's talk about the gnomes because this is a really, really popular crypt. I guess you can call them cryptids, right? Uh, they haven't really been identified by science. Okay, but people seem to be seeing these things. Now, tell, tell the audience about the connection to Rip Van Winkle and how close that was to your house. Oh, Rip's Rock, right now you can see from my front porch through the trees. Once the leaves come on the trees, you won't be able to see it. But if you walk a hundred feet down the road, you're staring straight up at it. You could probably hike to it from my house in two hours. If you go to what's called Winter Clove, it takes three hours to get there. Um, it, it's, it's, uh, and you know what? I looked, it's at the same exact elevation as Catterskill Falls, where um, Henry Hudson had his little people sighting. Oh, oh, okay. It's so I have to, both at seventeen hundred feet up the mountain. Rips okay. Rock and Catterskill Falls are both at seventeen hundred feet up the mountain, and they both had historical little people sighting. Um, now it's the gnomes, right? Only thing I really tell you about the gnomes is if you go look at any vintage Catskill Mountain, Catskill Mountains used to be a big resort area. You go back and look at any vintage Catskill Mountain memorabilia; it is all gnome and little people based all of it it's all gnome and little people based right really? every last bit of it there, there's a local campground called whippoorwill i was doing research and i come to find out that the mohegans called the native little people whippoorwills 
Then I ended up meeting the grandson of the lady who named the campground and come to find out Whippoorwill Campground, named after Whippoorwills. All these oh, years, you, you don't even know. Yeah, oh, yeah. so now Rip Van Winkle, uh, and I was reading about Rip Van Winkle a little bit more last night. Um, you know, he, uh, he, he was sick and tired of his wife. He dipped out to the woods. He had a naggy wife. She was annoying. He grabbed his stick and his dog and his fishing pole. And he hit the hit the trails. Yeah, there he is, good old Rip. And he hiked up to Rip's Rock, and he encountered little people. But I don't think they were native little people. I think they were more like gnome little people. And I think that's why you get the the explanation of the Dutch clothing, because to me, I don't know. Like if you think of the gnomes, and then you think of Dutch clothing, like that kind of lines up for me. I could be wrong. But I don't think it was native little people. I don't think it was like little Indian looking little people. I think it was like gnomes that he encountered. They offered him a drink. There was his drink. He took that there drink and fell asleep for 70 years. And, and that was in uh, 17, uh, 17, 1786, I think. He fell asleep in 1786. So he, so he, this, so this is a story uh, that was actually in a, it was, this is out of a textbook. Okay. Do you think that there's some truth behind this by any means? Uh, because you did, you did mention that Henry Hudson, who I, I'm assuming that's who the Hudson River Valley Hudson, is, yeah. in the in river the city of is named after, after, after. Um, now he, he, before this had had in 1609 had had an encounter with the little people in that area okay so i'm assuming that story and they was... offered these guys drinks just like rip van winkle okay really so yeah so unless the author of rip van winkle knew that of henry hudson's journal entry prior to writing his story whenever he wrote it then isn't it ironic that they both line up and they're both yeah. at the same elevation up the mountain about a mile away from each other oh yeah Okay, well, nonetheless, this is, it, it, I mean, it may or may not have happened, but people to this day still have gnome sightings. And you said that you have actually potentially gotten gnomes or little people in some of your pictures while you're out there doing your field research. Yeah, lots of them. Lots if, of I had an app, if I had an app right now that magnified pictures instead of cropping them instantly, I would have a handful. Really? Okay. Yeah. Are these, are these I mean, I can still little people? people now? They're just, you, you know, you're taking a four inch character and you're, you're pixelating it. But if you put a magnifying glass on the picture instead of pixelated it, then you would see what I'm talking about. And, wow. and you see, like I've showed my mom, I showed my son's mother, I've showed anybody that looked, that'll look, right? Okay. I, I have a little excerpt to read about the Henry Hudson encounter with the gnomes. Okay, so okay. it was September 3rd of 1609. Henry Hudson sailed to the half, what's called the half moon, into the mouth of the great New York River that later has his name, okay, the Hudson River. Um, they were going north for several days. They were searching for the passage to the Orient, is what the story says. Um, it was in the area that would now become known as Albany, New York. Uh, that night, they anchored down right there in that river in the middle of the Catskill Mountains. Around midnight, he heard music coming from across the mountain down into the river and taking a few members of his crew, he went and followed up to find out where that music was coming from. It kept getting louder. It says, to their astonishment, a group of pygmies, it says pygmies, with long bushy beards and eyes, beards, not beers, beards, and eyes like pigs, were dancing and singing and capering about in the firelight. Uh, he realized that they were the metal working gnomes of whom the natives had spoken of. Um, they spotted Henry Hudson and his crew and welcomed him with cheer. They offered him some beer, some brew, and long in the night, the men drank and played nine pins with the gnomes while Henry sipped a single glass of spirits and spoke to the chief of the gnomes about many deep and mysterious things. Uh, he realized it was getting late. Uh, he looked around for his men. He couldn't locate them. All he saw were a large group of gnomes laughing, joking as they sprawled around the fire. Um, then he recognized several of the gnomes as his crew. They had undergone a transformation and those grown men had turned to gnomes. Now, I didn't even know that was possible. That's it's, even just, worse. <laughs> it's, it's terrible. What were they drinking? God. Okay. No so he said, 
It says their heads were swollen to twice their normal size. Their eyes were small and pig-like and their bodies had shortened until they were only little taller than the gnomes themselves. Uh, he was at, he was alarmed. He asked the chief of the gnomes to explain. Uh, they said it was the effect of the magical hard liquor the gnomes had brewed, but it would wear off when the liquor did is what it says. Um, he wasn't sure he believed the little man, but, uh, but anyways, he, he hung out with them and the next morning when they woke up, they all had hangovers, but the men were back to their normal size. Okay. What in the heck has happened there? That is a really weird story. That is definitely a real weird story. I That's told you, if I ever told little people, I'm never going back there again. At least to that area. I'm, I'm just going to assume that maybe they drink some kind of weird fungus, like some kind of mushroom tea or something. Well, the proof you know? must have been a bunch lower than Rip Van Winkle's. He must have had some hundred proof gnome juice. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That is wild. Okay, so there's two stories, but in this one, the man actually watched his friends transform into gnomes. Okay, so, but but this mountain was right there in your research area, right across from where you lived. And, uh, and to this day, they still get sightings. Now, gnomes are one of my favorite topics. However, were you, have you ever been scared? Now, and I don't think you get scared. I wouldn't say you get scared. Have you ever been frightened or worried about the gnomes in your area? No, no, because no? I've never seen them, right? I've never seen a gnome in the area that I was finding the little four inch people in. I I stayed going through that area every time I went into that habitat and I stayed trying to find the little people and take the pictures of them. So no, but I've never seen one, you know, like the Bigfoot, right? I'm not scared of the Bigfoot. I'll tell you a story. Uh, last summer one night we were down in my mom's backyard. And the kids were playing manhunt around the backyard and in like the first 10 foot of the woods. And I had went up and got my night vision binoculars, came down, set them up. And we were looking at the Bigfoot in the woods, watching the kids play. It got point where I was going to go home. So I left my daughter, my two nieces, my nephew, my mother and my sister there in that backyard. You know, I felt more comfortable about leaving that backyard at that moment because some Bigfoot was in the woods than I would have if they weren't. And I was thinking to myself, like, wow, this is crazy. I cannot believe this. But the last time I saw Bigfoot was like uh, December. And I was walking through the woods and I looked back over my shoulder and I could see one peeking through like a gap in the trees like this. And I started running for like 10 steps. And then I realized like, what am I doing? This is what I'm here for. Of course, it was gone when I went back, but it scared the shit out of me. I don't know. It scared me. Like I started running for like 10 feet until I realized like, why am I running? Like, this is what I'm here for. I should have oh ran towards God. it. I know. But you're it's supposed, scary. We're supposed to run towards the noises, right? Just like Henry Hudson and his, you know, um, brave crew did. I guess that was pretty brave of them to go looking for the music. They were like, what is this strange music coming from the mountain? Let's go inspect. Okay. And, well, they didn't uh, have the internet, so they were probably clueless as to what's going on. Today, <laughs> people got the internet. They know about the gnome juice. The gnome juice. Oh my gosh, that would be a great name for a drink. Okay, if I if I was a beer manufacturer or some kind of you know spirit manufacturer, I would name mine gnome juice. I'm just saying. Okay, but uh, but that's me. Big Bigfoot gnome juice. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, interesting. Okay, well, so that brings us to another uh, interesting thing that's going on in the Catskill Mountains. Okay, so in the in intro of the show today, I had mentioned. See if I can find it. I had mentioned a giant that was turned to stone and became a mountain. Okay, so I just did a show last week with my friend Barry Littleton. We I had remote viewed a an incident where a UFO was shot down with a <laughs> missile in Russia. Uh, it was shot down. Five aliens, extraterrestrials, came out of this UFO, and they formed into an orb. And as they formed into this orb, an energy came shooting out, and it turned twenty three soldiers into stone. Okay, well, we made the connection of all these stone giants all over the world to potentially some sort of ET technology, extraterrestrial technology, something more advanced than what we're capable of having, apparently. Do you think, okay, have you heard of this story of this stone? Um, the, they call it the no, giant I monster. I uh, saw it last night after I talked to you, I looked it up. Okay. But have That's you, have you the, the mountain that they're talking about is on the back side. Like, if you were to consider where I am, the front side of the Catskill Mountain Range, that mountain is on the back side. That's, that's Oneida. Oneida County is, is out by Utica, which is the back side of um, 
backside of the Casco Mountain Range as opposed to where I am if it was the front. Okay. It's on the west There's side the... of the Casco Mountain, western well, side. Okay, so this, it, it sounded like it was kind of normal to have a giant back then. It said the Catskill Mountains was once home to a giant monster that fed on human beings. Okay, now we hear about the redheaded giants and some of these giants that did roam the earth. And there have been bones found at some of these Indian mounds and Lord knows where else. Uh, but they were, they were cannibalistic and they would eat humans from what I've been told. Uh, but it says they would, this would eat human beings and the great spirit turned it into stone as it was traveling to the ocean to bathe. The monster became a new mountain and rainwater filled the eye sockets forming two lakes near the summit. And that's that. I mean, it kind of lines up with the stories that we hear about these stone, the mountains that could be sleeping titans or sleeping that, giants. It's not the, I think um, Ireland or Scotland, they got all them stone giants that, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, and it's like Ireland or Scotland. They got all those stone giants. I don't know what they said, whether they were killed and turned to stone or they mm -hmm. the sun hit them and they turned to stone. Somehow they turned yep. to stone. Well, that's, and they're that's real strange looking. They look like they could be some stone giants. Well, see, that's what we were talking about last Thursday night on my show was that potentially what if it was some sort of a, an alien technology or some kind of explosion went off because when that ball of the orb and, and this wasn't a declassified CIA slash KGB document that this actually happened okay and there were witnesses to this so what if there is there was some sort of technology that was used to turn these giants into stone you know and uh and so maybe that happened up there in new york that's all i'm saying i'm just i like connecting dots charles <laughs> maybe one day i'll find a big stone foot <laughs> a big stone foot you might you definitely I'll might well well, there's also there's also rumors and stories about a witch in the Catskills as well. Now, every good every good mountain range has a good witch story, right? Every we have we have Spearfinger down here at the bod lower part of the Appalachians, but you guys have the Catskill witch up there. Have you ever encountered a witch in the woods? No, <laughs> no, not yet. I, I don't know. I've I've encountered some weird stuff that I don't really know where it's coming from. Oh gosh! Well, I never encountered no witch. Okay, well, to get to to kind of clarify, I definitely would not be going back. I'm from the <laughs> Blair Witch Project era. I was a teenager back then. Me too. Oh, Millie says that there's a state park in Connecticut yeah. called Sleeping Giant State Park. Ooh. Okay, very cool. I think this is definitely worth looking into a little bit more. With these big giants, uh, the stone giants. Um, but okay, yeah, I'm I'm from the Blair Witch. Witch era as well but but it didn't stop either of us from getting out in the woods and going hunting for a big I wouldn't mess with no witch. The moment something like that come around <laughs> i don't mind bigfoot bigfoot for some reason is not very scary to me but i i uh that's because i, I think that I, don't, I i guess i don't think i know that they're homo sapiens i know that they're just another species of us much bigger much smarter much stronger and uh much more adapt to this earth and, uh, and and I really feel like they're not going to bother me because they know the minute that they bother me, DEC and the men in black and the state troopers and everybody going to go there looking for what happened to this human. And that's the last thing that they want. I was chased yeah. by a bear once. Me and my mom, the bear was chasing mm -hmm. after us. And they hit it in, in, the, in the butt with a rock. Oh, that's right. You told me about that. And I think yeah. part of that is because we're like buddies. But I think an equally part of that is because... They know damn well if that bear attacked us. Now people are coming for the bear. They're going to come in there. They're going to try to hunt that bear down. They're going. To, they're not going to stop until they hunt it down because it attacked a human. And they're going to either kill it or capture it and relocate it, one or the other. Whoa. And Whoa. so now they got people in there running around their home, possibly yeah. see one of them if they mess up. Oh my gosh. Well, that that's an interesting dynamic, actually, when it comes down to it, because I like to think that Bigfoots are very, very much like just humans with hair. Okay. They're, they're, they're very exactly much like humans. Are. That's exactly what they are. There's been enough DNA studies by now starting. You might as well just go to the genome project because every other study is the same thing. It's not like you got all these studies and all these different results. It's all these studies and the same results, but nobody, 
no mainstream science is going to accept it. And uh, normally when it gets to a lab that is sophisticated enough to really dig it apart, they don't want responsibility for it. Right. Or the Smithsonian Institute comes in and scoops it up and then it just disappears. So, but it's, but the, all the DNA studies that have been done are all the same thing on the maternal side. It's identical. And the, on the paternal side, it is uh, all identical except for one strain of DNA is unidentifiable. It is a homo sapien. It's exactly what it is. It's a, it's a hominoid. It's a more advanced hominoid species than we are, without okay. a doubt. I think they're pretty advanced, for sure. Okay, well... In my experience, it seems like the, okay, so the Bigfoots, we've had experiences where there could have potentially been some kind of interaction with the spear finger energy. Let's just call it an energy out there in the woods with the Bigfoots. Okay. And we're, we're going to save that for another show one day. I've, I've mentioned that before, uh, but there's, there's some kind of interaction. You've been, you've mentioned the interaction between the dog men and the Bigfoot out there. Um, what about ufos and ets because i think you mentioned ets earlier about that picture that you sent me which i terribly forgot i totally feel terrible i forgot to upload that picture i'll put it we'll, we'll put it out later i think it's on your facebook page though isn't it uh, at catskill mountain bigfoot yeah okay so you guys go and become a member over there y'all go join his facebook page and uh and see that picture but there's often et activity and i like to say the head of one of my teams always says all roads lead back to et when it comes to bigfoot with a lot of the Bigfoot activity we have. Um, there was there was a movie made, okay? A movie about four or five years ago. And this was called, uh, oh my gosh, what was it called? Catskill Mountain or something like that. Um, but it's it's pretty much about a group of campers. Okay. <laughs> oh no. Now, now we're, we're, we're talking, that's a, that's a scene from the movie, okay? And, uh, and we're talking about the Blair Witch Project, okay? Because the Catskill Mountains are, pretty they can be pretty scary especially to people who are not familiar with dense forest okay and all the critters out there but it's a yeah, once you get to the top of the mountain you can get lost easy the woods are so incredibly thick every line of trees is a wall of trees you walk 20 feet from somebody you can't see them no more okay it's very it's similar to some of the georgia forests that we have here and down here in the south but oh and to clarify the your the Caskill Mountains are part of the Appalachian Mountain Range, correct? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. It's just the northern. The I could walk from map. I could walk from me to you if, if I wanted to. I, it would only take a few months, probably a couple months. Month. <laughs> take a month? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but yeah, you could. You very there's something called the Appalachian Trail, and, yeah. uh, and the people that hike it all the time. Yeah, you can go from Maine to Georgia. I think I think that's where it ends. You can. You can. Okay, so. If they if they base this movie now the the movies is is the kind of the the general gist of the movie is that the, there's like five campers they go camping and they get accosted by an ET extraterrestrials they get abducted all this stuff that is it's it's a possible threat when you're out there in the woods doing our our boots on the ground research okay um, but if they're making a movie about that I did not go to the MUFON website I didn't I didn't go look any of this up but I'm assuming they do have reports of abductions out there i mean missing people clusters is no not there? really is there not one there no you don't have a lot of missing people in the catskill mountains people get hurt all the time but you don't you don't get a lot of people missing uh but the catskill mountain forest park or whatever it's called catskill mountain park the forest you know the state forest is huge and anything yeah look how big that is anything look okay once you yeah. hit that green that woods is so thick that everything and anything that needs to go on in private away from human eyes would surely go on there i tell you what i i have seen right i've seen a row of trees yeah, that's exactly what, you know what? That looks like where I stand at one of my, that's North Lake. No, that is, that's the valley. That's got to be Catskill Falls that they're looking off of. Oh, that's, that's beautiful. The valley that goes up the side of the mountain. Yeah, it's so beautiful. That valley where, where I just moved from, that valley leads right, right down to where I lived. Uh, the winds would come through that valley and you, you 
you try to put it like a um a shed up in your yard, it'll rip it right apart. You really? you won't even last the season. You put a screen, any the wind comes through that valley there and it increases <laughs> and it comes whipping out that valley and it'll rip anything that you got down. Oh wow. So it's not just Bigfoot's out there ripping stuff up, it's the wind. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh okay, I have I have one more cryptid that I thought maybe we talk about or at least touch on it because whenever you're looking up cryptids of the Catskill Mountains, this thing comes up. Okay, this is like a rake. Okay, this is something that um yeah yeah there the pill crawler the rain so that's why my mom won't go to habitat number one no more. Mm -hmm. I'll bring her on your show sometime. Every experience I've had, she has had. We have those in a whole bunch of pictures. Long, skinny, gray things with long, skinny fingers and those white eyes, and we have a video where she's like. She's like maybe like 30 feet in front of me. And all of a sudden, her hair comes up like something picked her hair up to sniff it or something. But you couldn't see what picked her hair up. Because all you could see was like uh, a haze. And you could only see it through the camera and on the video. I didn't, I seen her hair come up with my own two eyes, but I didn't see the haze. But when you watch the video, you could see the haze. Something picked her hair up. She's sitting there on a log about 30 feet in front of me. She might have been standing. I think she was sitting, though. And her hair comes up. Like, her hair's on it, right? And huh? it comes up. Ooh. And then okay. falls back down. Okay, well, that, that leads us to something else, too, because there are spirits out there, and they say that the Catskill Mountains are haunted. Yeah. Do you think that yeah. that could have been a spirit that potentially grabbed your mom's hair like that? This area of New York State is so incredibly old. The Hudson Valley is extremely haunted. It's one of the most paranormal places in America. I was reading about it this morning. Uh, and that's right across the river. Red Hook, Hyde Park, Claremont, um, all, all the way down all the way down that river where people first... Uh, there's all kinds of... The Fiddler, the, a guy that got murdered on the bridge. I've seen that this morning on Facebook. That's right in the same area. Uh there's all kinds of paranormal stuff going on down there. And I'm oh, sure wow. it's here too. I don't really hear about it. You know, I just had a guy contact me that has a paranormal group that lives right in the same town as me. And I told him that I don't do paranormal stuff. But if you want to come do some Bigfoot stuff, no problem. I won't do the paranormal stuff because it's all real. It all exists. It's all real. And I'm not, you could bring it home with you and I'm not trying to do that. Um, I, you know, we almost think that habitat number one made my mom sick. She already had cancer, but it like made her brain sick. And so the moment I hear of anything paranormal, I'm out of there. This guy's okay. like, I'm a paranormal researcher. I'm like, that's great <laughs> for you. Yeah. I'm I'm so sorry to hear about your mom. Well, you know, we just lost the head the head of our team, North Georgia Cryptid Researchers, Bob Wilson. Well, we got he, that. He, that he didn't passed, hurt me. It hurt he, her. Yeah, well, he he passed away a couple weeks ago, and um, and he was one of the gentlemen who walked into the portal uh, along with my other friend, one of my very best. They're both my best friends. Okay, like we're all a big family, and uh, and so we can't say for positively that that radiation got both of them, uh, but they both they both passed away since then since they did that. And every time we're picking it out in the field and we're picking up on paranormal activity going on, there's little spikes of radiation going on out there so well, I, I told you what i think them spiked are and i can i could pretty much prove it mm -hmm. uh and and, you know, and i i'm thinking that this might be one of the reasons why the bigfoot won't come close to us why there is that separation between us okay so i have at least 10 different videos taken with the cell phone it doesn't seem to happen over the camcorder but if you take the video with the cell phone you could hear the white noise as the bigfoot gets closer stops and goes away it's a white noise that you could hear it in the background it almost sounds like a plane's flying above but there's no plane and is what that is is that's the bigfoot coming closer so if that's the amount of energy that they're giving off their bodies who's to say that that energy does not affect humans in a negative way my mom swears to god that going to that habitat and dealing with that troop of bigfoot was making her mentally ill and they zapped us. And when they zapped us, my face went numb, but it, it, it affected her. It gave her a headache. She was like, 
you know, disoriented, disoriented, nauseous. We lost an hour. That was the weirdest thing. Oh my gosh. So you had missing time as well? Yeah. Yeah. It was supposed to be nine o'clock. It was 10 o'clock. Ooh. Okay. You know, I, what I'm finding, I think a lot of that missing time has to do with something that's extraterrestrial out there, extraterrestrial <laughs> or, or, or portal related as well. So I think, what, I think I sent you the video, the one video that I, that I have readily available of the zapping. Um, it doesn't sound like a whistle. I said, do you hear that whistle? It doesn't sound like a whistle, though. It sounds like a 1990s wristwatch alarm going off, like beep, like a real super low beeping tone. Beep, beep. And we had that happen to us three different times. But at the time, we're having Bigfoot activity. The second time, they're throwing rocks over the ridge at us. They're flanking us on two sides. We seen a deer. The deer huffed at us and ran off. And then next thing you know, we heard, Beep. And I got that one recorded for like a minute. And as the beeps go, it, it, it interferes with the phone and, and, the, and the screen flickers every time the beep happens. Ooh. So there's some kind of energetic interference, some kind of electronic interference. <clears throat> there's there's something that's going on. I mean, there everything out there is all about energy, frequency, and vibration in my book. That's why I don't like taking Absolutely. electronics out there when we're doing our research. Because... First of all, our electronics are going to potentially get zapped. Okay. And uh, yeah, I go through a phone really once every three, four months. Look, if you're not going through a phone once every three, four months, you ain't got Bigfoot activity. At least not like me. Yeah. I, I like to keep if, my phone back. If at my phone, shot once every three, four months, shot. Because every time I go in the woods, they kill the battery. And after like three, four months of doing that, it, the phone stops. This phone won't turn off no more. It does things on its own. It, when you hit like like uh, search, it takes like two minutes for it to come up so you can type. It's all jammed up inside because it's been zapped 50 times. Yes. Okay. Oh, Carol Carol has an interesting comment here. Uh, did you get a chance to listen to the story of the little boy with Down syndrome that made friends with the family of Bigfoot? I did. I looked that up. That's amazing. Yeah, there's there's it's interesting because it's. You, you hear stories like that where there well, my is son is really autistic, right? Check mm -hmm. this out. You showed a picture last time when I was on Spaced Out Radio of, of a juvenile Bigfoot peeking around a tree, right? You can really yeah. see its face good, right? Yeah. And I said it's about the size of me, if you were to put it into perspective, right? That picture, I don't get that picture without my son, right? I do not get that picture without my son. I got that picture because that juvenile Bigfoot, chances are, is around the same age as my son. My son's severely nonverbal autistic, and he's a Bigfoot magnet. You could take him out. You could walk him down the street through Bigfoot habitat, whistle a little bit, and then next thing you know, you got activity. And they're not coming up to see me. They're coming up to see him. His mother moved to, to a trailer park down the road, right? Prior to her moving there, I'd never seen anything that brought my eye over there. And I've been around the area all the time, and I look at the woods more than I look at the road when I'm driving. All right? They moved there. Next thing you know, there's archways and triangles and teepees and X's and asterisks all over the place. Why? Because he's habituated. And the moment he moved in the trailer park and he's habituated, the family group that lives around the trailer park were attracted directly to that corner of the woods, to that trailer. And they started building all kinds of tree structures around the trailer. Wow. I could one day I'm going to make a video of it. One day I'm going to get in my car and I'm going to drive down the road and I'm going to show people how many tree structures on the side of the road and how many tree structures are around that trailer, around that corner of the trailer park. It's insane. It is absolutely insane. Wow. Okay. Maybe uh, you know if I said there was 30 tree structures, I might be under. Oh, wow. Well, maybe they're putting yeah. up a protective, a protective energy bubble around your, your kid, you know, and uh, just just to to, you, you understand what I mean by that? Like, when you're doing Bigfoot research and you can go out there all you want for 50 years, right? Until you become habituated with a family group of Bigfoot, it's not going to make no difference. They're always going to evade you. They're always going to dip as soon as you get in the woods. They're not going to try messing with you. But if you put the time in to, to habituation, right? Habituation is becoming accustomed or used to, right? Uh, in the dictionary, the sample sentences, they habituated with the chimps, okay? Just for anybody who doesn't like the word habituated, let's get that straight. Um, right. So you go and you habituate with the, 
with the, with a family group and, and it's weird it's almost like they imprint upon you and now you're every single family group knows that you're habituated you can go anywhere in the world every single family group knows that you're habituated and instantly they treat you different instantly instead of you searching them out they search you out is all you have to do if you don't live around them is find a, a qualifications for a habitat just go there if you're already habituated and you moved into the middle of new york city and you want some big foot activity and you're already habituated, you already know what it is. They're going to come to you. For some reason, before you become habituated with a Bigfoot or a Bigfoot family group, they treat you like you're the plague. The moment you become habituated, it's like they have a dire necessity to check you out, watch you, watch over you. I don't know, but check you out. I, I used to have up to 10 Bigfoot on the creek bank. Those are all the juveniles of the local family groups. Coming out and playing at night, probably doing what they're not supposed to do. Go check out the human. But they had like this dire necessity to all be there all spring, summer, and fall, five out of seven nights a week. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Well, they're we know they're out there around you and in your family. And uh, now, so did did you say your mother? Your mother is pretty psychically switched on, right? And she picks up on the My energy. American, like feathers, yeah. wearing feathers, teepee dancing. Oh, if yeah. anyone knows New York State, yeah, yeah. Carson City in Frontier Town used to be Wild West reenactment parks. And I used to spend all my summers in the Indian village. Oh, very cool. So you have ancestry that's Native American? Yeah, yeah. More yeah. so my sister. I'm a little caucasian out through my father. My sister's more so. My mother's much more so. A little Indian lady. Yeah. Yes. Okay. This is a good, this is a good question or so. What about psychic abilities? Does that attract as well? It does actually, because Absolutely. the more, the more psychically switched on you are. And I think that that's why my teams get a lot of, a lot of really cool activity when we're out in the field, because we're all tuned into our psychic our, our enhanced human capabilities as I like to call them. And, uh, and so you're shining that light. It's almost like you're radiating a light. We all radiate light. Okay. But when you're able to pick up on telepathic communication and pick up on the psychic, psychic energies out there, things are w much more attracted to you. Okay. And, um, okay. <laughs> yeah. So they're, they're much more attracted wow. to people who are psychic for sure. Okay. okay. All right. Well, let's, um, let's, yeah, let's well, you know what, let me tell you something about that. It's really important for people to understand. Bigfoot are absolutely telepathic, right? Humans at one point were absolutely telepathic. You're very telepathic, right? Bigfoots are, uh, every Bigfoot can probably remote view. It's probably a common thing for them. They're telepathic. There's no lying in Bigfoot society. There's no agenda. There's no lying, right? They know what each other thinks. Okay. So psych psychic ability if, if you're somebody that's very spiritual and you have good psych psychic abilities or you're an empath, as this person said, absolutely. It's going to skyrocket your ability to do research if that's what you're trying to do or just interact if that's what you want to do. Awesome. Yes. Okay. Well, let, let's wrap it up today. And uh, do you, do you, what do you have in your future, Charles? What's going on? Are you, are you going to be out there doing some more Bigfoot field research? Yeah, well, my son just came to live with me full time. So it's gonna destroy my job and I'm gonna have to be some sort of stay at home dad now. And which is gonna give me all kinds of time to do Bigfoot research. So I'm, I'm really upset about it. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, and, well, that's and, uh, actually not a bad thing, I guess. If you can no, get I'm, not at all. I'm, I'm super happy. So I'm about to be doing full-time Bigfoot research again because he gets yeah. on the bus in the morning. He gets off the bus in the afternoon and I got in between. So yeah. well, I don't awesome. have to work five days a week. I can't. I can't with him. So looks okay. like I could be doing a whole bunch of Bigfoot right in the backyard. Well, maybe, maybe you could start taking people out and doing some tours and stuff. That'd be fun. Yeah, that's what I'm going to put I all that together. I would, I would sign up for that for sure. I think that's amazing that you have uh, access to, to such a beautiful area full of cryptids, full of monsters. And by monsters, listen, I never, I never consider a Bigfoot a monster. Okay, so I when when I made that title, I was like, man, Bigfoot's not a monster. Um, but uh, but yeah, <laughs> but but there are some they're made, they're made into monsters by mainstream media. That's remember, right. they're, they're a dragon, it's like a dragon, Bigfoot, dragon don't exist, they're monsters. Yes, 
Yeah. I tell you what, um, I, I didn't really think about it, but there's that trail. You could, from where I live, you could walk people up Rip Van Winkle's trail right to Rip Rock. It's public land. Nice little parking lot and everything. So I'm going to open, I'm going to build a business doing Bigfoot expeditions. I'm going to bring people out into Bigfoot habitat and teach them how to identify, habituate, and interact with the Bigfoot species. You know, I, I'm bringing them out into all verified habitats that I already researched. So show them all the tree structures, all the proof and stuff that they, they're there and uh, teach people how to do a, a habituation process and teach them how to do the research. And in the middle, I can hike them all around the Catskill Mountains. I could bring up Rip the uh, trail that Rip took to Rip's Rock, and I mean, people come from all over the world to go to these places and have these sites from North and South Lake. I think you see five different states from the look out there. I oh think my it's God. five different states. Yeah, yeah, and I know where all the like the, the last little trout sanctuaries are and all the best fishing spots. I'm from the area. Uh, there's that cave. You can go down to that cave and go hiking in that. But I made it video of a cave not too long ago that cave's like a mile long you go in that cave there you come out on the other side of town oh yeah oh yeah don't get me yeah. started on caves okay uh don't get me started all right because we're cave caves can be kind of creepy but there there are just do you think that the bigfoots are taking the caves as like a highway underneath the ground is that where they're going at night or, or during the day when no. nobody's seeing them no, I think they live right out in the open. Uh, they have no need for a cave. The only need they have for a cave, look, they don't need a cave to evade people. They just cloak and stand up against a tree. That's it. They don't They don't need a cave to evade people, right? They don't have to run into a cave and hide from people. They could hide right in front of your face, and you would never even know the difference, unless you knew the difference. They might not be able to hide in front of my face, but they can hide like 50 feet away from me, and I'll never know the difference. Uh, I think those caves are just, if anything... For the young to go down in, I think the young might use them. The one cave in habitat number two, I think the, the babies use it. I think that they put the babies up in there sometimes. And the, they definitely utilize the cave because they broke trees to hide it. So they're definitely utilizing it. But I don't think it's Bigfoot, I think, sleeps out in the open on a bed of pine needles. I think yeah. they sleep right out in the open. They need to, they need to move like this. Yeah. Somebody's here. Boom, gone. They don't need to be dipping out of no caves and their bodies and, and there's so there, there's such an advanced species of hominoid to the earth that they're out there naked. No clothes. Naked. They're not cold. You think they're cold that winter? They're not cold. They've adapted over probably millions of years. My opinion is, is that they're the indigenous hominoids of earth. That's my opinion. I think so too. And I've got I've got mine right here. I got this really awesome bigfoot the other day. I've got my bigfoot. Yeah. I like it. Here. That's not here. I think that's a I think that's a girl though. I call her my girl. Okay. But uh but yeah, I um I, I agree with you hundred percent. I think they're very advanced, highly oh, advanced beings. Yeah. Uh, and they, don't, they don't have this, to, this is the thing, right? they don't have to run from us. Bigfoots yeah. are masters of quantum physics. We are masters of modern science. Modern science is pennies, quantum physics is dollars. That's the equivalent. So when you want to talk about the intelligent level, you're comparing pennies to dollars. We are, we're, a long time ago, they started separating X's and Y's. X's were free thinking people, Y's were not. You got a world full of non free thinking people that like to be fed the truth and put inside a box. Yes, there are. Well, we don't think outside the box here at the Cryptid Hunters channel whatsoever. We've busted out of that box and so my goodness this has been such a fantastic show charles thank you so much for being here today to talk about all this you have all, so much knowledge on bigfoot uh just from your boots on the ground experience out there i can seriously yeah. appreciate that big time tell tell the audience where they can find you and uh on your, your facebook bigfoot. Right now, the Facebook group is the best place to go. It's got the majority of my stuff, but I'm in, in the process of building my YouTube channel. And if anybody's interested in any expeditions, upstate New York, Catskill's about an hour and 45 minutes above New York City. And I could give you the best wilderness adventure you ever had. You want to do something scary around Halloween? Go do some nighttime research. You'll be scared. You'll never go back in the woods again. Yes, it's it's it will. I don't know. It's some some people in the chat have 
listened, uh, have watched the Blair Witch Project. So that did come up. And uh, and there is that movie that I did bring up where that girl's getting abducted, too, by the by the UFO. So <laughs> Even but, if it uh, was happening, that. they're not telling us. They're not going to tell us that that's even if people were disappearing, the people that they're with is hit with not not non disclosure agreements. Their whole family is hit with one. You go ahead and open your mouth, and we'll destroy you in your whole bloodline. And oh nobody's ever going to know what happened to you. You got ate by a bear or fell off a cliff. Oh my gosh! I know that's one of the dangers, and that's why I was asking about missing persons clusters up there, and if there were any. Yeah, no, you never uh, hear about it. You never you hear about hear nobody. About you hear about people falling off cliffs all the time. Wow. All the time. Helicopters are flying up there to scoop people off the rocks. Oh, my gosh. All right. Maybe, maybe that's the gimmick. Maybe if you have some sort of messed up event, they bring you to the rocks and push you off. Oh, no. You're already that's dead, right? That's <laughs> no, that's it. Just scooping people off rocks. There ain't no. Oh, no. In, in, in thousands and thousands of people go to North and South Lake every year. It's a huge camping area. Okay. Wow. Well, listen. It's where the old Casco Mountain Hotel was. Oh, I've seen that in pictures. Okay. Well, the next time I come up to New York, I'm coming up there to come hang out and do some Bigfooting with you for sure. <laughs> this has been amazing. Okay. So you guys, please go to Casco Mountain Bigfoot on Facebook and join this group. And you've got a YouTube channel too on there, Casco Mountain Bigfoot. Charles, thank you so much for being here. Please come back and hang out with me again. Absolutely. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Well, you guys, please come see me tomorrow night. I'm going to have a remote viewing show for you guys at 8 p.m. Eastern tomorrow night. And uh, and then, of course, I just announced, if anybody was not here at the beginning of the show, I just announced a brand new show. I'm going to be doing another Cryptid Hunter show. What, Like I said, what does a girl who's super duper busy do with her YouTube channel? She makes another show. Okay. So uh, Saturday nights, I just have so much. I have such a wonderful uh, response from all the researchers around the world, around the United States that want to come on my show and talk about their research and their exp experiences and their encounters. So we're going to do a Saturday night. I'm going back to Saturday nights at 10 p.m. I formerly had a show at Spaced Out Radio on Saturdays at 10. And so I'm going to be doing a show on my channel at 10 on Saturday. So uh, I hope you guys will come. Uh, I'm, I call it on the hunt, but it's just another show here. So y'all please come see me this Saturday night on the show. I like I Thank you. I have Ryan Tremblay coming on. Ryan was in the chat today. Uh, Ryan Tremblay is going to be coming on. We're going to be talking about Wendigos and Dogman and Skinwalkers and all those other fun. Just, I, I want to say cryptids, but I don't think they're all cryptids. So, uh, but anyways, come join me tomorrow night, y'all. And I'll give you more information about Saturday. Everybody have a wonderful day. Uh, I hope you all learned something. Please stay safe out there. Charles, thank you for all your wisdom. And we will see you guys tomorrow. Bye.